All right, let's talk some fights. Uh, we're going to go Bellator heavy here because uh, Bellator has been making big news the last couple of days. I don't know how much you've, you've seen of it uh, in international waters, Frank. But first of all, our good pal, Chael Sonnen, has his next fight made. He is going to take on the axe murderer, Vandalay Silva, in a fight that was supposed to happen years back in the UFC. Oh, wow. It's going to headline a card at Madison Square Garden in June. Here's the real kicker. It's going to be on pay-per-view. Bellator is going to make their sophomore effort at the uh, the pay-per-view business. Now, that's going to be the headliner. And Fedor Emelianenko versus Matt Mitrione will be the co-headliner. That's another fight that's been rescheduled. Uh, we can speculate on who else might be put on that card. But right now, as I tell you that news, Frank, uh, with with Chael and Vanderlei in the main, Fedor and Mitrione in the co-main, pay-per-view in June. How do you think that sells? I think it does unbelievable. I mean, Chael Sonnen is a huge draw i mean we've seen how many i mean just recently his numbers with tito ortiz i mean tito's still a big draw but i, I still think that you know chael makes one hell of a fucking interesting case for to watch him fight yeah uh you know i mean uh, honestly i think you know <clears throat> you know i think guys like connor are good at selling fights but honestly i think as far as marketing and the ability to talk and on the on the fly to make things up i, I think chael's kind of second to none really uh you know he's one of the best uh with the mic and so uh you know i think there's a huge backstory between vandalay silva and him i think the animosity is going to be 100 percent genuine i know for a fact that vandalay silva despises chael sonnen if, if he could get the referee out of there and fight into his <laughs> to the point to where it really came down to the fact that uh the two of them entered only one of them left vandalay couldn't be happier yeah you and know so uh I think it'd be an exciting one. You know, I think Matt Mitrione and, uh, you know, Fedor's a solid coat. You know, it. I was thinking about this. As far as I can remember, this would be the first time that the UFC has, in, in a sense, kind of done Bellator's marketing for them in terms of laying the predicate for this fight. Now, you know, we were talking on our last episode about the rumors that Matt Hughes is considering a, a, a comeback fight in Bellator. And by the way, there's a little more news on that because Hoyce Gracie has weighed in and said he would take that fight in a second. So we may see uh, Hoyce and Hughes part two over in Bellator, but that fight did happen in the UFC. In the case of Chael and Vanderlei, that was a fight that was not only announced, uh, it had a whole season of the Ultimate Fighter leading up to it where the two were coaching against each other. We had a press conference that I attended where, you know, the, the, the fight was promoted, and it wasn't really until, you know, pretty close to the 11th hour that the fight was called off. So in a weird way... It's like the UFC, even though it's a few years removed, kind of did all the advanced promotion for Bellator to eventually realize this opportunity. Yeah, Bellator's doing a good job of taking advantage of where they can see to bring themselves into that uh, position. Um, you know, the UFC can only keep so many people under banner unless they're going to start just paying guys to permanently retire. Uh, they're going to run into this situation. And I think they kind of did, you know, and, uh, you know, with their old uh, uh, ambassador type spots. That they, yeah. You know, Forrest had, still has, but Forrest, you know, works really well with the company. Uh, you know, Matt Hughes had that ambassador spot. And, uh, Chuck Liddell had an ambassador spot. And so essentially, I think that another way of looking at it was that these guys were put on payroll so that they would, you know, and I think you and I had talked about that. You said that, you know, they could uh, basically to the extent of their possible career. You know, you know, a guy can come back and still fight. You know, we've seen Dan Henderson fight at 46, but you know, I think that if you keep them on payroll until their late 40s, early 50s, you pretty much guarantee that you'll never have to have a situation where the competitor, you know, at Bellator puts one of these guys on a, uh, uh, a headline fight, and that's the situation they're having now. Yeah, it's um, it, it's it's a, a real opportunity for Bellator. I mean, the timing is right. You know, as I say, I mean, they're, they're, they're still a distant number two, but 
they're 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 making up quite a bit of ground uh, because of of timing, but also smart moves that they've made, uh, and and uh, you know the majority of those would would likely fall at the feet of Scott Coker. So no no surprises there. All right. So if they announce it, the, by the way, the pay per view will be uh, it's Bellator 180. That's going to be on June 24th. Now I was looking to see what the UFC had planned around there because it, it's also a good time to catch the UFC in uh, a little bit of a lull because if you think about it, Frank, that will be prior to the big July card that happens every year in Las Vegas. So you know the UFC will be stacking that card, and a lot of times what happens is you know maybe the, the card the month before the month after is a little light. And the UFC 212 pay-per-view, the pay-per-view for June, is going to be Jose Aldo versus Max Holloway. Now, that's, that's going to be a great fight. That's a fight I want to see down in Brazil. But in terms of a couple of guys that, you know, can really take to media to market a pay-per-view, um, you know, neither one of them at this point are, are Conor McGregor on the mic. So that also probably leads a little bit to Bellator's benefit that they're not going to be competing that particular month with a UFC card that right at the top of the card has, you know, the kind of fighter uh, like a Conor or a Ronda that's going to be all over mainstream television to promote it. I agree with you. I think it's a great opportunity. And I'm curious if, if uh, the UFC keeps it going, because we've seen in the past where they've now recently had cards that were going to, you know, to go along with Bellator. And I think so they didn't have to deal with a direct correlation of competing they didn't want to have that so uh if i remember correctly they had a fight scheduled at the same time the tito and Chael, tito and Chael, yep. uh, a battle and they canceled it now obviously that was because you know uh, bellator was going to be a non-pay-per-view event so it's readily more available for people to watch that and not have to pay you know 60 some dollars to, to, to purchase a pay-per-view so i think they'll be on more of an even playing field if bellator's on play uh, doing a pay-per-view but i'm curious if they decide not to either go one or two directions one tone it down and not even put one up or go ahead and try to pull out a you know some of their bigger stars that are uh, draws on pay-per-view to go ahead and try to uh you know bury bellator and, and start putting that narrative that they're still number one because i mean i think that right now that's kind of what everybody's talking about you know bellator's on the rise they're getting a lot more attention, you know, uh, around the world. And UFC right now, they're in a downsizing stage of their uh, the organization. Everything is, is cutting back, letting people go, cutting corners. Uh, I was just sitting here talking to some of the guys, and they're talking about that, you know, now that when they, with the fighters, and they see at some of the events, that, you know, UFC is renting hotel rooms that are 40 minutes away from the venue to save money. And, you know, oh, so yeah. it just shows you the mindset of where the UFC is right now. I mean, and I understand that, you know, they just spent $4.2 billion to purchase the company. Uh, right now, they're trying to make this profitable as soon as possible. Uh, but I think that makes for a perfect storm for somebody to go ahead and really take over and, and, and increase their uh, their their share of the uh, hold of the share of uh, MMA viewers. Well, if I were to guess, I would think that the UFC of, of your two scenarios you just pitched on uh, June 3rd at UFC 212, I would think what they would try to do is step on the gas a little bit because they will precede that Bellator pay-per-view by a couple of weeks. So they they have an advantage there because let's say if they put on something that's very compelling to buy and you buy it the first weekend of the month, maybe you've already shot your budget by the time the, you know, the third weekend of the month rolls around. As I look at the card right now for what's announced, uh, besides the main event of Aldo and Holloway for the uh, featherweight title, uh, Kelvin Gastelum and Anderson Silva are going to be on that card. You figure right now that's probably sitting in the co-main event spot. But other than that, not a lot of things to drive uh, purchases toward pay-per-view. I'm sure they could add toward that. Now, if you look at Bellator, because I do think we have to talk now, Frank, about what else you put on that Bellator pay-per-view card to really knock it out of the park. Because I do think that Bellator is going to have to do a little more than even the UFC would do on a given pay-per-view month in order to get people to do something they're not used to doing, which is paying for the Bellator product. You know, right or wrong, uh, that 
that Fedor Mitrione fight was already was going to be offered for free. So while I think it holds a legitimate place as a co-main event on a pay-per-view, I think Bellator is going to have to to stack that card uh, e even deeper uh, in in order to make it uh, really sellable. Now I'm looking at Bellator's schedule, so let's talk about what other fighters they could add to that card to uh, uh, make it uh, you know make it purchase worthy. Um, I guess uh, well, first of all, Michael Chandler's out there. Uh, they they could put him on there. Uh, always uh, a great fight. Always great to watch him fight. But the thing is, if we're going to look at sort of um, you know marquee names that are are uh, recognizable to the the average viewer, now we're about to see uh, King Mo and Rampage Jackson fight. That's going to be this month on March 31st. So March, you know, April, May. June, roughly three months away, uh, depending on the outcome of that fight. I mean, it, you know, you could put Rampage or Mo or both on that fight card. And uh, I think particularly in the case of Rampage Jackson, that would probably help push pay-per-view sales a little bit more as well. What do you think? Oh, yeah, that would be huge. And then, I mean, if right now they can accelerate the whole Matt Hughes conversation. Oh, um, yes. Yeah. I think that would be a massive... Uh, no, you know what? That's it. You're right. Injection. That's what you do. You put, you put. I didn't even think about that. You put Hughes and Hoyce on that card for you know the 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 old timers or the you know the people who uh, were were in the habit of buying all the pay per views uh, you know better part of ten years ago, and that's a that's a big sell. Now, uh, Bellator, and here's here's some more news you you may not be aware of, but Bellator just had two big signings, uh, two big free agent signings. One of them is Lorenz Larkin, and the other one is Ryan Bader. He is now signed with Bellator. So Those are the two big ones. I don't think people even understood why Lorenz Larkin was released from the UFC, but I think that's that conversation again of the guys that haven't quite made it to the superstar status, that they're feeling that they can go ahead and grab the guys in the lower tier, raise them up to that same level that a Lorenz Larkin was starting to become, but for a lot cheaper. Yeah. No, I'll tell you what you do. I'll tell you what you do. You put uh you put uh Hoyce and Matt on there. You've already got Fedor and Mitrione and you got Chell and Vanderlei headlining and then you put Bader and Phil Davis on the card as uh Davis is Bellator's lightweight champ or light heavyweight champion. And then something else. Was that, for they fought game. once already, if I they remember did. correctly. And, wasn't and a little Bader, bit of boring? It was. It wasn't exciting. Bader beat him. That's certainly going to be the case Bader's going to have for you know getting an immediate title shot in the organization when he's got a win over their champion. Uh, yeah, and I don't know how exciting it would be a second time around. You know, it, it, there may be just kind of a lot of wrestling going on, but that's okay. Because you you can you know you can market it as a championship fight and a couple of uh, UFC alumni without having to count on that particular fight to drive all the pay per view sales. So if that's like, I mean, if you could have a light heavyweight title fight in the first or second slot of a five fight pay per view, that'd be pretty impressive. Yeah, that would definitely. And then you know. Brazil is still one of the biggest followers of the MMA. I mean, you know, USA, Brazil, you know, I know Canada is so big, but uh, they get a lot of viewers from Brazil. And so having a Vandalay Silva on there, having a, a Hoyce Gracie on there, that you really get a lot of that uh, the Brazilian injection of, uh, of viewers. And I think that makes for a lot of sales.